Welcome back to the Endocrine System on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about the gonadotropins, which is a term used to describe two major hormones that are released from the anterior pituitary gland. And those are follicle stimulating hormone, or FSH, and luteinizing hormone, or LH. And so the first thing we're going to do is talk about just generally how they get released, and then we'll go into the various effects of each of these hormones. Now, in this video, we're not going to be talking about, you know, cycles of when each thing is released. We're saving that for later videos. This is just a simple, when they are there, present in the blood, what they do. Okay? So, we're of course going to start up here with the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is going to generate a hormone called gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Now, uh, make sure you pay attention to the way this is written. This is a G with a lowercase n, Rh. Uh, if you're not looking at this very carefully, you might mistake this for growth hormone releasing hormone. This is gonadotropin releasing hormone. And in any case, GnRH is released into this network of blood vessels right here called the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system, which then carries gonadotropin releasing hormone down to the anterior pituitary gland where it will stimulate the release of these two hormones. And those are follicle-stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH. And as I mentioned, these two hormones collectively are what we refer to as gonadotropins. Okay? And that's actually where this hypothalamic hormone gets its name. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone stimulates the release of gonadotropins. And these two gonadotropins, FSH and LH, are then released into the blood or the general circulation where they travel to different cells. Now, gonadotropins are going to have effects on the gonads. And these two hormones are going to have different effects in females than they would males. So I have the female section on the top and the male section on the bottom. Now, this is kind of a nice organizer that I've made. Let me explain how it actually works. On the left side here of this whole picture, we're looking at gametes, or what effects on gametogenesis do these hormones have. Okay? On the right side, we're looking at the actual synthesis of the hormones. Okay? So left and right, gametes and hormones. Okay? Also, it's worth noting that the left side here, we're talking about follicle-stimulating hormone, and the right side, we're talking about luteinizing hormone. So you might be able to make a guess that luteinizing hormone is going to be more important for the synthesis of hormones, whereas FSH is going to be more important for gametogenesis, and it turns out that that's actually true. Also, there's a couple other cell types that we're going to mention that are specific to males and females. In females, we have a cell type called granulosa cells, and then we have theca cells. We're not going to really get into the specifics of these, but we will see basic functions. And then in males, they have Sertoli cells and Leydig cells. Okay. All right, so we've got FSH and LH traveling in the blood. So we're actually going to discuss males first because they're a little bit simpler, as I've kind of alluded to in several videos over the reproductive system. All right, so luteinizing hormone, or LH. Luteinizing hormone is going to specifically in males act on the Leydig cells. So Leydig cells are cells that are specialized for generating androgens in males. And these, again, are located in the testes. Okay. And so when LH acts on the Leydig cells, the Leydig cells respond by increasing the synthesis of two androgens. And those are testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, which we usually abbreviate DHT. Okay. Now when we say the term androgen, andro is a prefix that means male. So an androgen is a hormone that causes masculinizing effects. Okay. So, for example, when a person is going through puberty, it will cause deepening of the voice, increase in the size of the genitals, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, testosterone is the one we usually think of. However, testosterone can be converted through one enzyme called 5-alpha reductase into this hormone called dihydrotestosterone, which actually has about 20 times the biological activity as testosterone. So DHT is an extremely powerful androgen, and as far as I know, it is the most powerful androgen that's a natural androgen that we have in the human body. Okay? So those are the Liebig cells. Now for follicle-stimulating hormone. 
So FSH acts directly on the Sertoli cells. Now, what are Sertoli cells? Well, they're involved in spermatogenesis. They are not cells that directly cause spermatogenesis. They more assist with it. So these are located in the seminiferous tubules, and really they're more like nurse cells, meaning they just provide nutrients and provide a little bit of extra help. Uh, without that help, spermatogenesis would suffer tremendously. So these really are very important in spermatogenesis. And so follicle-stimulating hormone will actually, in that way, promote spermatogenesis. Okay. Now, going back to the Leydig cells, I mentioned that LH causes the Leydig cells to start making these two hormones, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Well, these hormones can also act directly on the Sertoli cells, which also promotes spermatogenesis. So spermatogenesis is not done by the Sertoli cells, but it's strongly assisted by Sertoli cells. And these cells are stimulated by two hormones, or really three follicle-stimulating hormone, and then these two androgens, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Okay? So when we're looking at males, we have one kind of cell that generally is going to make all the hormones, and then we have one cell that's going to be involved in the gametogenesis, in the male gamete being sperm cells. Okay? Now we're going to see something very similar, a very similar setup in females. Okay? except this time the cells are granulosa cells and theca cells. Okay, So again, we're going to begin with luteinizing hormone. So luteinizing hormone, or LH, is going to act directly on theca cells, and it's going to allow the theca cells to make two major hormones. One is estradiol, which is the major estrogen. Estrogen is not a molecule. If somebody says, oh, this is the molecule estrogen, they don't know what they're talking about. Estrogen is a class of molecules. There's actually a few of them, estradiol being the major one, and then there's, of course, estrone and estriol. Okay? But this is the major estrogen. And then progesterone, which is the most important progestogen. Okay. So theca cells start making these hormones, okay? and that's all due to the action of luteinizing hormone. Okay. Now we're going to come back to luteinizing hormone in a minute, but I want to actually jump forward and now look at follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. So in females, follicle-stimulating hormone is going to act directly on the granulosa cells. And in the same way in males, where the Sertoli cells promoted spermatogenesis, the granulosa cells are going to promote oogenesis. Now the granulosa cells, if you do a study of the female reproductive cycle, you'll see that these are kind of serving a similar function. They're sort of like nurse cells, but they're doing so for the follicle, which is the container that contains the egg where oogenesis is occurring. Okay, so granulosa cells are assisting in that strongly. Um, they're not directly causing it, but they are strongly assisting. And if you don't have functional granulosa cells, you cannot get pregnant. Okay, so these are very important. And so follicle-stimulating hormone is going to trigger the granulosa cells to start promoting both oogenesis and folliculogenesis. So the oogenesis is the synthesis and maturation of the egg, and folliculogenesis is the maturation of the container containing the egg. Okay? So you have to actually do both of these things, but they're both classified under gametogenesis. All right? Now, coming back to the theca cells for a minute, remember that luteinizing hormone triggered the theca cells to start making estradiol and progesterone. Well, in the same way as in males where these hormones could act on the Sertoli cells and trigger gametogenesis, these two hormones can act on the granulosa cells to also trigger gametogenesis. So we also have a second source of activation of gametogenesis, that is these two hormones, estradiol and progesterone. Now let's pause for a minute. If we go back to males for a second, notice that luteinizing hormone had no action on the Sertoli cells directly. The only thing that luteinizing hormone did was act on the Leydig cells, and that led to hormone production, and then those two hormones acted on the Sertoli cells. In females, we see an additional a source of activation of the granulosa cells. It turns out that luteinizing hormone not only can trigger the production of hormones via theca cell activation, but luteinizing hormone can also act on granulosa cells. So this effect where LH is acting on the gametogenic cell, we only see that in females. It's not pronounced in males at all. So luteinizing hormone is the third way that granulosa cells can become activated.
In females, luteinizing hormone also has some effect on the granulosa cells. And it's also worth noting that a surge in luteinizing hormone is actually what will eventually trigger ovulation during the female's menstrual cycle. Okay, so before we conclude this video, let's talk about one more thing. And that's again the negative feedback that we see characteristic to all of these hormones, growth hormone, thyroid hormone, cortisol. So these gonadotropins, that is FSH and LH, can feed back and inhibit the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Which makes sense, because if we have plenty of FSH or LH, then presumably we won't actually need any more of it. And so these two hormones can come back here and inhibit the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone, which in turn will inhibit their own release and bring levels back down to baseline. Okay. So hopefully this makes sense and gives you a good overview of the functions and interplay between follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.